All right, I think I'm up and running. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I hope you are able to join me tonight. Um, do excuse me, I'm running a little bit late. I'm so terribly sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm running late though with dinner and my children's therapist, music therapist just left. So um, hopefully now we can get started and it won't be too noisy here at my house. All right, let me make it over here to the group too so I can get information ready as we need it. Like usual, does anybody have any questions, comments, um, suggestions? What do you want to talk about? So, because as I said, these are done for you guys, and um, you know, you can pick and choose what it is that you would like to discuss. Let me see. I know earlier there was a lot of active discussion tonight about specific learning disabilities. Um, and I hope you guys can find the units. That was the other thing we were discussing, right? Is like not being able to find these units. So um, the problem is usually I log in on a computer um, or my phone. So and the Android phone to find the units in the group, you'll go click on the group. So you go to the IEP 504 assistance group. And then you'll see the blue banner where it talks about the name of the group. And then there should be like a little bar right under it and above where you would write your comment. And so there is where you find the tab that you're on, which is discussion. And then you can scroll just a little bit and one of them should be unit. And you select unit and then that'll get you going. Um, and then once you're in the unit, click on it, the name of the unit, and it'll kind of take you another level into the unit. So those are my two bits of advice. Hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, so hi, Renee. Hi. She said, random question. What determines if an intervention specialist versus a Title I is used? All right. So I'm going to say, actually, I'm not really sure. So let's see if anybody else has any answers. Now, I don't know. It's not often I kind of get stumped. I know there's some relevance there to the Title I. It's not something I hear a whole lot. And I'm sure if I did a bit of Googling, I could find some information. Um, question? Because I know something about Title I. Uh, intervention specialist versus a Title I person. Title I coordinator decides how the money from Title I is spent. Okay. And what's Title I? Title I is federal government money. Well, I know that, honey. <laughs> All right. So y'all may not be able to hear, but John's kind of answering the question or trying to, which he's saying that a Title I person is in charge of Title I funds that have been given to the school. And I think the Title I funds are meant for poor school districts and Correct. used for tutoring and things like that. Um, whereas an intervention specialist should be somebody, probably an, uh, somebody who's doing like RTI, response to intervention, and they're there to assist in um, RTI tier two and tier three intervention. So that's my guess. You are correct. Um, and then Gina said, in our district, they're the same. And that may be so. And, and that's quite possible. And John confirmed that too. Right, he said that's possible. Hmm. So Gina said, the school is Title I if a certain percentage of the students get a free or reduced lunch. And that sounds correct. I mean, that's what I was saying earlier. I think Title I is associated with school districts who don't have as much funds. They get additional funds from the federal government. So, and then typically they use those for remediation and things like that. All right. I feel like I'm off on the camera tonight. Okay. So, um, Renee says, 
So if my son was retained and received services as part of that, so Title I, um, and so she's, oh, so I guess maybe that is response to intervention. And then she said, maybe that's why we get Title I. Um, so that at the IEP meeting, an intervention specialist came when we asked for academic goals. Well, I was going to say, if the intervention, I mean, that sounds something above response to intervention, where they would be working if they're discussing academic goals, don't you think, honey? Yeah, John said, yeah, nodded and yes. The, the uh, support coordinator will decide based on the goals what intervention needs to be done. So they're the one who picks the curriculum that's most appropriate to whatever the goals are for their IEP 504. Okay, so again, I don't know if you heard, but what he was saying was um, potentially the intervention specialist then could be the one who's there to, you know, um, hear and kind of think about like what curriculum and, and kind of academically what's the best plan. Um, and it's probably someone who um, potentially is like a special education teacher or something along that lines. So um, Renee also says we have a reading disability diagnosis to add to his IEP. So you're working on adding that now, I'm assuming. If you're working on adding that now, um, I think that would be good and you want to get that in and services started as soon as possible. All right, so let's see. Um, yes, she said. Yeah, it, and I really hate the fact that schools usually wait so long to help children who have reading disabilities. It's, kind of disappointing actually um and i know it's usually a big push in order to get them to kind of get on with it which i don't understand because most states also have laws for dyslexia specifically on the books um so i don't know why um hi karen i was gonna say y'all excuse me i'm like in the middle of eating my dinner um apparently james is joining me Oh, I want to sit here and I actually want to see what you guys are talking about. No, go away, James. Oh, okay. This is for the parents, James. Parents. Parents don't want to see you. They put their own children to bed. Go away. Yeah, well, I, I'm a parent, too. Okay. Oh, nothing. Um, so Gina says, also some districts only have special people trained in special programs, like Orton Gilliam. And so they may be called intervention specialists, too. And absolutely, Gina, and I've heard that quite a bit. Um, so that's definitely something that's very familiar to me. Um, then that's part of the problem I think we're having defining what is an intervention specialist exactly, right? I don't know. Because I think since this is a national group, I think it means different things in different places. Um, so hi, Charity. How are you? Glad you can tune in. Please, y'all ask, you know, whatever questions. Um, so Renee says, our school will not recognize the reading disability. They will. You just have to keep laying into them. I mean, at some point, it, something's going to give. Um, grades, state assessment, um, smaller assessment, something is going to kind of give way and show where this issue lies. Uh, let's see. So, um, oh, and Renee, if you're, you know, if your child needs, right, um, OG, kind of help, the Orton Gilliam, um, they should be getting it. I mean, it's kind of that simple, right? Or a Wilson or um, an Orton Gilliam based program. So just make sure that um, you kind of keep pushing on them. And at some point, like I said, something will give. So don't give up. Keep laying into them. All right. What does, you know, like, what do you guys want to talk about tonight? I know there was a lot of discussion on um, the specific learning disability unit that I created. I'm going to try to, hopefully you guys can take time to look at the units. I mean, 
units are used in a bunch of different ways and most of them are mandatory like most groups I've seen they're mandatory and so what happens is when you join the group like you're forced to go look at all these various units the group is put together normally it contains the group rules and then maybe like resources for the group or something like that um, I did not make my units mandatory everybody still comes first to the discussion page like they're used to seeing I think this works better because I want y'all to do it on your own and then if you look in the units, that's where I'm trying to gather up all the information that's been in the group. And I'm trying to like put it into these units so that you can see um, the resources that we have. Some of them are posts I've written. Some of them are just other internet links that I have gathered. And I try to get all this together for you guys. So that way you can just go to like one spot, go look and then see everything that you need right there. And then I might for, issues that are more of um, a neurodevelopmental problem, something like autism or ADHD, then what I'm planning to do is to try to write um, kind of a little blurb of things that I think, you know, like areas I would suggest testing in based on what we just commonly see in medical literature or peer reviewed journal articles discussing that disability I mean, like most of the neurodevelopmental disabilities have like a host of symptoms that are common so uh, let me see so Julie uh, Julie wrote a comment and she said I just recently had my second grader exempted from Ohio's third grade guarantee now the discussion is what to do for state testing or alternate testing so he's seven minimally verbal with an AAC so if I think you would probably want to get him alternatively tested and um, all right so let's see he has ASD so is does he have any true um, intellectual delay I guess would be my big question right so you said he's nonverbal, but there are some children who are incredibly smart who are nonverbal. So um, if he is intellectually delayed, I would say absolutely alternative testing. If he does not have issues with intellectual delay or isn't significantly impaired um, executive functioning, then you might want to consider regular state testing so the only concern would be if you did alternative testing that might set him up and you know, like going forward into the future that he wouldn't qualify for a standard diploma at graduation and so potentially that may be something that will be an issue you know so just something to think about and watch um let's see and so Gina was just saying each day has different qualifications for alternative testing um, and she said you know hers is IQ and adaptive testing scores under 70 and yes pretty much all states do have some kind of standards there um, where you know there's sort of this cutoff point that they try to make I don't know why because everything should be done individually in my opinion because that's the whole purpose I mean it's an I and the IEP individual so if the child you know needs alternate assessment then you should be able to do that um, I don't remember which state it was but one of them I was reading about recently was talking about putting a cap on the number of children you know what actually I think it was maybe the federal government the cap on the number of children who can qualify for alternative testing and I th the, the guidance document I was reading was talking about you can go over the cap but you can only do that if you fill out all this extra paperwork and then prove that there truly was a great need um, so it was just kind of interesting yeah so Gina was just mentioning she's in Arizona like me so I'm in Arizona um, Let's see. So Julie said he was writing his name in ABCs at two and a half. He may be way behind, but the communication is hindering um, to see where he really is. So I understand that because my son Joseph was like that. Um, now he was nonverbal until he was four, and then after that he did start talking. So 
that was good. We were very happy that he started to talk. Um, now really, actually, is he quiet? I spend a lot of time telling that boy to be quiet. Um, so it is difficult, but there are still like nonverbal tests that you can give to do assessments. And there's, you know, a way to kind of potentially integrate his AAC. So um, I'm not sure. I mean, I like, I would think you could still get a reasonable assessment done. Um, so just something to think about, right? Let's see. Oh, so Gina was saying she goes, um, she doesn't know why adaptive is considered. It doesn't make sense to me. So what happens is typically, okay, not always, but normally children who have intellectual delays are also quite delayed in their adaptive skills. So they didn't want to, I'm thinking that they didn't want to just use IQ as the only measure. They also use the, um, the adaptive score to help determine if a child had a true intellectual disability or not. So that's my guess. Um, all right, I think I'm at the bottom of the comments. So like I said, what do you guys wanna discuss tonight? I'm willing to discuss anything that interests you. Again, um, so there was a lot of talk about specific learning disabilities um, and sort of especially issues with dyslexia, um, a specific learning disability in reading. And so we were talking about when somebody um, is seen as having dyslexia, it's really good to kind of rule out some other potential causes. So one of them is auditory processing disorder. And um, I did post a study in the comment section of that unit. And um, with the, um, so there was auditory processing disorder. If you can't hear the sounds, that's going to impede your ability to read new words, right? Um, so there was also um, aphasia. So aphasia impacts your ability to comprehend words. And again, there was a peer reviewed journal article that I left in the unit. The article on aphasia is very interesting because basically it's what some of you discussed that you notice is a problem, which is reading comprehension. Um, and then we'd also brought up um, auditory aphasia. Ah, I just lost the third one, but it's in the unit. I mean, it's in the unit or it's in the comments of the unit where we've been discussing, uh, oh, uh, vision issues. So a child can have vision issues, right? So convergency, insufficiency, and that can be impeding reading. So these are things you might wanna take the time if you can and kind of pursue and then try to rule out as potential issues that could be impeding reading. Um, so Gina says aphasia is very rare in school unless they've had a stroke. Actually, it's not as rare as you think. And you can have aphasia and people not know that they had had a stroke. So as an example, um, my daughter, Margaret, my daughter, Margaret was born prematurely and you do see this often happen in preemies where they'll have a stroke. Well, she had an ultrasound done several times and not once in any of the ultrasound or other tests before we left the hospital and she was in there for two and a half months after she was born, did we see any sign of stroke or brain damage. So fast forward, I'm seeing all these things. I don't know what's going on. Um, and then I happened to run into a mom at an event who had a child with disabilities. And I started talking to her about all these weird and quirky things my child does. And she looks at me and says, you really need to get her evaluated for autism. I was like, what? Autism? You know, like at the time, a decade ago, in my head, I'm seeing this picture of like Rain Man or, 
somebody who is severely impaired and they're sitting there like banging their head against the wall. That's what I thought autism was. And when I started looking into it, I was like, oh my gosh, this could completely be my daughter. And after more testing, we found out, yes, uh, she is eligible for a medical diagnosis of autism. And she was diagnosed as such. Now, I happened to have friends at the time on Facebook who were like, hey, with a, you know, when a child has autism, there are other things that are like underlying conditions that could be making a child present with these symptoms of autism. Because I really look at autism as a list of symptoms. There's really nothing specifically that's diagnostic of autism. So a child either kind of fits these lists of symptoms or they don't. And if they do, then they're considered to have autism. So I wanted to do a little more medical investigation. And in my daughter, we did an MRI. And in the MRI, we found that she had a cyst, a hole in her right frontal lobe that she suffered from um, diffuse white matter brain injury and that she had suffered um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, high, right? It's H-I-E or he, high. Anyways, <clears throat> that was what happened. And I, um, I was not happy to find that out, but it did make a lot of sense because Margaret suffers from, um, she understood words well enough, but she couldn't speak them. Like they just wouldn't come out no matter what she did, they didn't come out. And then finally they did come out, but they were gibberish. And then after that they did come out, but then they were only used to label things. Like I could point at something and she could tell me what it was, but she couldn't do anything beyond that. She could just tell me the word, she could name the thing and that was it. And then finally I got Echo Lake talk. So it was everything that she was saying, she heard on TV. Um, and then it kind of morphed again from there to, you know, cause we were still, we were getting intensive speech therapy the entire time. And so it morphed again. And then when it did, we finally started to hear some of, you know, Margaret come out, her independent thought, you know, you knew that those words were her and her independent thinking. So it's been very interesting to watch that kind of happen over time. And I do think there are probably a lot of children out there who are wandering around who may have suffered brain injury at birth and nobody knows because they just happened to never have an MRI of the brain. So, um, so Courtney, hi Courtney. Courtney says, hello from Virginia. Hi, how are you? I hope it's not too late. I tried to split the time difference between the East and West coast. Um, so she says, um, we have just about every test under the sun to offer to our school for consideration. So we've done a lot of private medical testing. And she said in two years, he has had two private and one school-based neuropsych. Well, that's interesting because I'm like, schools don't tend to have neuropsychs anywhere in their ability. They usually are just school psychologists but you absolutely could have seen privately a neuropsychologist. So she's saying though, using all the different tests, so she said this last one identified concerns with reading. There is no official diagnosis of any form of dyslexia, but it was interesting to read. He was disorganized in decoding. So um, again, that could be an issue with well, potentially a few things, right? But it could be maybe the ear, the auditory processing issue. Um, let's see. Said, but it was interesting about the decoding. The most recent neuropsych noted he had several risk factors for reading difficulties. Decreased fluency, guessing words based on an uh, initial letter. Said, I'm concerned of this because there was concern noted for testing accommodations by his teacher, but the teacher said he cannot get testing accommodations for reading without um, an issue in decoding. Well, I would ask her, where does it say that in writing? Um, because as far as I know, that's not written down anywhere. And though issues with decoding is 
one of the things that's typically like the hallmark of um, dyslexia. It's not always for everyone. And I would seriously think about and consider auditory processing disorder. And if you search the group for hashtag APD, right, auditory processing disorder, you will churn up a lot of information in the group that I have posted over time, um, including, I'm sure, quite a few medical and like in peer review journal articles. Because um, people are always running into this issue where their child's having a problem. And um, when they kind of get it solved, it turns out it is an auditory processing disorder. Um, and that's why I can't hear the sounds. And then you would also notice some other signs because you would notice he mishears things um, when you're speaking. So it's like they mishear it and it's close to what you said, but it's not exactly what you said. It's like maybe something that rhymes. Um, so like rush instead of push is something that sounds similar, but it's not what you said. Um, those would be these kind of red flags for auditory processing. So Courtney says, by the way, my son has an IEP with OHI as his first category under IDEA and then autism is secondary category. Well, Courtney, that's a little odd because usually you have autism as the primary and then OHI as the secondary. Normally the autism is more involved and it's the bigger problem in the academic setting. So unless your child is maybe like on the Asperger end, very, very high functioning. Um, it's a little, that's a little odd, but at least they're both on there. And the biggest thing is, and I tell people this a lot, according to case law, what really matters is not the category that's on your child's IEP, like, you know, which eligibility they found for your child. What truly matters is, does the child have everything that they're needing in order to gain FAPE or FAP, uh, FAPE in the um, educational environment? That is truly the most important thing. The rest of it's irrelevant. So as long as they're addressing all of his needs, then you're fine. But like I said, it's a little odd. Um, so Jim is saying it's rare to see in schools, though you see it more often in the hospitals. Yeah, well, and the school won't call it aphasia. They can't make a medical diagnosis. Um, but often at the root of the problem in a reading comprehension, is aphasia, aphasia issue. Um, so Erica, she said she'll have to come back and watch this later. Um, so Courtney says, sorry, it was a psychological assessment. You were correct. Okay. Because I was like, that would have been really odd. I mean, it would have been cool. I've never, I've not once ever seen a school district, even at the district level, um, have a neuropsychologist. So um, Erica said, agreed, many teachers here, and um, she goes, my teachers here, I'm in Mississippi, said that they cannot accommodate my son on reading subject tests. It's crazy. Yeah, so that's the part where they're supposed to be like reading themselves and showing that they have the reading ability and the reading comprehension. Um, but I do think for state assessments, it's not terribly fair. Um, but normally they're not held, if the child has a known specific learning disability in reading and they score poorly in the reading and reading comprehension part, that shouldn't cause them to be retained, but it should cause you and the school both, right, to go back and go, wait a minute, we're still behind or we're falling further behind, and then say, you know, what are we going to do now in order to fix that? And uh, that's the important thing that you need to address. Because remember, according to the Supreme Court case that happened recently, um, the injury case, the Supreme Court unanimously said, de minimis, doing the minimum is no longer allowed and that your child should be making something more than minimum progress. And so a lot of people interpret that as, you know, definitely not falling further behind, right? So they are falling further behind. Then you and the school really need to look at, like, do we need more time in therapy? 
Do you think the program is the problem and the program isn't working and we need to try a different program? It's time to go back to the drawing board and figuring out what's wrong. So Courtney says he has a rare genetic malformation. Autism is this considered secondary to the diagnosis. Uh, I could see that, but that would still be a more of a medical thing than it is a school, you know, like educational thing. Um, hi, Martha. Hi, how are you? Glad you could join us. Uh, let's see. Gina says, I have to disagree. I can diagnose aphasia and I haven't seen it in over 800 SPED students. Well, that's great. Um, I find that interesting because I do see it come up more than you would think in my group. Um, as a matter of fact, we were just kind of talking about that earlier. So um, then again, I may have in my group sort of the hardest cases because um, I think that's why everybody's here, right? Everybody's here because they're having a significant problem with their school. It's not a little thing. It's a big thing. Uh, Nat said, my daughter um, said all of the special ed children sit in one part of the classroom or certain tables. I don't even know how to address this. That potentially would be a discrimination issue and it would be a worthy potentially of a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights for discrimination. So, um, it you know, it's segregating the students and you cannot segregate the students like that, especially in a classroom where there's other general ed students. So um, just something to consider. Potentially it's worthy of a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights. So Erica said she was not looking at that. Um, oh, that was nice. Thank you, Gina. She says, yes, you give wonderful help. I try to do the best I can, right? Um, I'm one person <laughs> and I, you know, only I know well the things that touch on my children. Now, I, since I happen to have surviving quadruplets and the three survivors were preemies and they have a lot of medical issues, I happen to have covered a whole lot of topics. And I, after that, some of it was just, I find it interesting. And then my son, Joseph is technically considered medically undiagnosable. And because of that, often it's, you know, I'm still researching and reading and I'm looking because it seems to me that boy should have one unifying diagnosis to explain what's going on with him. And we just don't have that. He heard me call his name. Come over here, Joseph. Mm. All right. There's Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Hi. Joseph is 11 years old. He weighs a whopping 45 pounds. It looks like I don't ever feed them. Do, do I feed you though? Uh, yes. Yes. How often do I feed you? Um, do I feed you a little bit or a lot? A lot. A lot. Because what's the name of the game, Joseph? What are we supposed to do? We are supposed uh, to get... What are we supposed to get? Eating. Yeah, we're supposed to get eating. We're supposed to get fat. That's usually what I tell him. He has to go get fat. All right. Excuse yourself. Go get fat because I'm pretty sure you didn't finish your dinner, did you? Bye, guys. Yeah, I didn't think so. I like how he didn't answer. So, um, yeah, I got a funny story if you'll ever want to hear about being in a gas station and I'm telling my son to put back a banana to go get something fattening and the look the woman gave me. <laughs> That was hysterical. Um, so um, Nat said hello. Um, and so Gina said, you're handsome, Joseph. Hi. So everybody was saying, hi, Joseph. <clears throat> yeah, Joseph is a lot of fun. Um, and, and he's quite interesting. And I, like I said, I still don't know what all is the problem with Joseph. You know, I mean, I don't mean problem him. I mean, just problem physically what's going on with him. Like I literally do feed him all the time, pretty much every two hours throughout the day. I try to feed him as much as he will eat and he only weighs 45 pounds. We even use nutritional supplements and see a nutritionist and we still don't know what's wrong. We have no idea and I can't get him to get any fatter. Um, and then 
you know, he's only four feet tall. That's probably because he's so lightweight and he's so thin. But again, we don't know where it's going. Um, he just, he has a lot of really interesting things, but none of them quite like line up to come to anything diagnostically. It's just been really difficult. Um, and so, like I said, I still, I search for things and I read and I read medically and probably every night I read medical journal articles for an hour or two every evening, just looking at things. So Nat says, do you have any advice for um, comp services? The state ordered my daughter's IEP team to meet and discuss it. Oh, that's fun. Yay, good for you. Usually you have to fight to get compensatory services. So I think that's wonderful that they're offering that to you and you do want to meet. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they supply. Do they Are they currently giving good services? where you could go, okay, we're doing some good services, we're making some progress, so what I would like to do now is to have you do it more, or is it that you feel like their program is not working well, it's giving you a terrible service. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry, had my wild kitties at the back door, scratching up my door. Okay, so um, anyways, if they're not giving good service, then maybe what you want to say is, hey, I don't want you guys supplying the service. I want to bring in an outside tutor, or I want to go um, to some kind of therapy center that specializes in this kind of you know, service that you weren't giving my child and see what they say. So those are some possibilities, and those are things I have seen done for compensatory services. Um, so Erica was asking about Joseph, and she said, so he eats good and isn't picky. You know, weirdly, he's not picky. He is my least picky eater. Now, he was terribly picky for a long time and was very orally defensive. That boy would button his lips, and that's what I was doing with the spoon. And he would not open his mouth. <laughs> um, as he got older, when he was two, he finally would open his mouth and let me put in a spoon. And then I could only feed him stage one baby foods. And then at three, he was still eating stage one baby foods. And then at three and a half, I was like, oh my gosh, my child is forever going to be eating stage one baby foods. I need to do something more. And I found a feeding therapist. So we removed to stage two baby foods. And then by the time he was five, he was finally able to eat stage three baby foods along with soft foods that are regular foods like sandwich, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a banana, things that didn't require chewing. And he fatigues when he chews. So he has hypotonia, low muscle tone that goes throughout his whole body, right up his neck and into his face. Um, so it, you know, that's kind of tough, but at least taste and texture wise, he's not really picky. He's actually pickier about temperature. He likes everything room temperature. He doesn't want it hot and he doesn't want it cold. <laughs> so, um, Melissa, hi, Melissa. And she said, I wanted to ask you about one to one aids. All right. So, um, do realize an aid potentially is just anyone, right? It can be a prayer professional. It could be a teacher. Um, you know, it may be somebody with less credential. It normally, they're just an adult person. Whereas a prayer, if you ask for a one-to-one -one paraprofessional, then you're asking for a certain level of certification, essentially, right? So that's one thing to think about. And she said, um, the request was denied during your first IEP. Did you get a prior written notice from that IEP and did they explain why the aid was not granted? And then she said um, her son has cerebral palsy and hydrocephalus and um, he uses a gait trainer for his poor balance. Does he have ataxic cerebral palsy? That's what my son Joseph has. He has ataxic cerebral palsy. Um, so he said he did have a grade four brain bleed on the right side. So he probably has um, 
at least diffuse white matter brain injury and then most likely, um, you know, actual cyst holes in his brain. Um, and that would be part of what throws off the balance. And she said, tomorrow is our second IEP and I have agreed to let go, to let him go without the aid. And she goes, am I making the right choice? I'm so afraid if he gets hurt, he is nonverbal four-year-old. Um, thank you so much for doing this and lovely boy. So thank you. And, and you know, Joseph, he has a lot of fun. Um, as far as the aid, do you think he really needs it? If you do, then fight for it. Um, so you just need to lay out a case for why he needs to have the aid in the educational environment. And just because he might get hurt won't necessarily dissuade the team like by itself, right? But you might be able to bring in like a doctor's note, the, the doctor also saying, hey, this child needs an aid. Um, because they're about to move into a busier environment and therefore need someone to look after him on a regular basis or he needs somebody to look after him during transition times or out on the playground. I mean, you may like specify instances instead and you're actually probably a little more likely to get the school to sign off and agree if you okay. limit it in specified in instances. Could you get out of here? Wait to bed. Sure. Can you can wear that to bed. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, it, usually it's a little easier to get them to agree to specified instances versus, you know, having an aid from the very start of the day until the end. So, um, so Melissa said, wow, he sounds like my Joshua. He only eats stage three now. Yes. Isn't it killer? It's terrible. Um, so Joseph did progress and he can eat foods that he has to chew, but he hates it and he fatigues. And if I make him do that, then he won't eat as much food overall because he's tired and it's taken him so long to eat and chew the food. Then he feels full. Um, and so a lot of times I don't really want to fight with him. So I give him just a little bit of harder chewier food and then the rest of it's soft just so he can you know kind of shove it in his mouth faster um so gina says yay for feeding therapists right feeding therapists are amazing um watching feeding therapy can be a bit tough but it's important these children overcome the sensory issues that they have revolving around food um, otherwise, you can run into these huge problems, including, you know, failure to thrive, which is what Joseph's considered to suffer from. He has a medical diagnosis of FTT, failure to thrive. Um, so Erica was saying, um, was going to say, if he doesn't like eating with low appetite, CBD oil has helped my son start to eat you know i tried some with that boy and it didn't work like nothing ever works right with him it's just sort of funny like i can't ever quite get it together with him on one given basis and it's very tough he's very tough um and again he you know has kind of stumped me and, and he I, he stumped at least 15 specialists so I'm, I feel like I'm in good company so far, um, but I'm determined to know more and be more than the specialists. This is part of the reason I read and research. So Melissa was saying left hemi, yeah, periventricular leukemia, v, PVL. Uh, my daughter Margaret also is considered to have the periventricular leukemia, the PVL. So uh, Margaret has the same problem along with that cyst in her right frontal lobe. So, and those can impact all sorts of things, including speech. So it's important to know these things. Um, and like I said, a lot of people have no particular reason to have an MRI of their child's brain. And when a child is small, it's kind of a traumatic thing going through the MRI machine and you have to do it with contrast. and. Children don't tend to sit still, they're too fidgety, so then you need to sedate them, and so that makes it an even bigger thing. Um, so that's normally why, you know, not only do most people not want to get their child an MRI of their brain, um, but also most doctors won't do it without some really good reasoning. And if you went to them and said, 
my child has a reading problem, a reading comprehension problem, I would like to do an MRI of their brain, they're going to be like, what? Because it doesn't make any sense to them why that may be information that would be relevant medically. So that's, that's my thought on it anyways. Um, does anybody else have any questions tonight? Y'all have been quiet, comparatively speaking. We've been really busy some nights. Um, and I will say uh, I will be back next week to do this if you guys are interested. Again, this time is for you guys and for you to be able to ask questions and for me able to like respond the, to your questions directly um, instead of just posting in the group. So uh, Sarah says, hi, he has, a, um, has he had genetic testing? Yes, Joseph has had genetic testing. We did not only whole exome sequencing, um, we also did a muscle biopsy looking for cerebral folate deficiency. Um, well, no, sorry. The muscle biopsy was for mitochondrial disease, and then we did a lumbar puncture to check for cerebral folate deficiency, and none of that came back making any sense, um, but none of it really gave any diagnostic answers either. And I think one of the more interesting things about Joseph is um, he, in the muscle biopsy, that boy is just, you know, you see him, he's skin and bones practically. And in the muscle biopsy, he had a lot of fat in between the muscle fibers. And I don't know what to make of that diagnostically, besides the fact it doesn't make any sense that he would have a lot of fat, a lot of adipose tissue in between the muscle fibers. Um, but we haven't been able to figure out what to diagnose. I and mean, we did check for FOD, fatty oxidation disorder, and he does have unusual numbers, but they are not elevated enough in any of the areas to be diagnostic. He may have the very long chain fatty acid disorder, maybe, but if he does, it's not typical. And it's not a typical presentation of it. And so he hasn't been formally diagnosed. And they think that he may have mitochondrial disease. But again, the biopsy didn't come back showing anything um, that was known at that time to be indicative of mitochondrial disease, though symptomatically he presents with a lot of things that look like mitochondrial disease. This is always just a story. He's close. It looks like it but it doesn't quite reach the threshold of being diagnostic. It's very interesting. And like I said, he really has stumped people medically. Um, so Sarah also said, my son is going in for testing next week. He has autism and I was wondering if this could give us an answer. It's hard to say. Um, there are some genetic conditions that do predispose your child to have symptoms that would be classified as autism. That's what I'm going to say and stick with. And um, at least genetic testing is something to do and cross off the list. And if you get an answer, then at least you can be satisfied in knowing an answer, right? Um, where I've had all this testing and stuff done and we have zero answers. There's nothing definitive for Joseph, which is part of what makes the boy so interesting. Um, so Courtney said, yes, I agree. Um, you are totally awesome. Well, thank you. Um, she goes, I have two more questions. I promise, and Courtney, you ask as many questions as you want. This is the purpose, right, of this time. So she said, um, I was wondering about the difference between the Whipsy uh, 4 and the Dash 2. And so the most recent uh, the most recent evaluation we had said he was totally solid within age expectations this year on the WIPSI four, but he performed lower on the DOS two than from the previous year. And that's also kind of interesting. So my second question is also about compensatory services. My son is making progress with the compensatory services he's receiving, but not so much in the classroom. And that's, I don't think, terribly surprising. Um, so are these push-in services or do you mean these are services just done at the school? 
And then she says he has a one on one and in inclusive or in an inclusive mainstream classroom with sped pull out for math and reading. Well, there you go. So um, he's pulled out for doing the math and the reading. And she goes, it's an obvious training gap and there is data to support it. Aha. So that's good. And I'm glad you have that information. So my advice is that I would ask for the teacher to receive training. And it's not just the teacher he has now, right? But the teacher he's going to have over the summer receive training and what they need to do um, because you are allowed to ask for training when your child needs it. So um, that's something to consider and I highly urge you to do so. And I think it's a good, you know, like a good tactic, right? Um, to go ahead and ask for that training. Let's see. I know a lot of you too have also wondered a lot of times, right, um, how I can kind of turn up information so fast. I will tell you, part of that is one, I just, I happen to have a good memory. Um, I'm blessed in that area. But the other one is there's a lot of these resources. I have them all bookmarked. <laughs> so as you see sites, things of interest, do take time, you know, like if it's a website link, bookmark it. So that way you can keep coming back to it later. And that's not to say it'll always be there because there's been some great resources like, um, oh, um, my recording laws for all the states. It was a great resource and I lost it just recently. Um, because the people who hosted that link, they changed up their website and they put that behind a paywall. And I'm really sad. And I'm really sorry because I don't think I downloaded it. I don't think there was a way I could. It wasn't a file for me to download. It was just a web page. And I really wish I had taken the time to kind of copy and paste that and put it in my web page. So sorry about that because now I have no good, clean way for us to look up state recording laws anymore. And I'm sorry, but I'll continue looking for a resource. And when I find one, I'll make sure that I share it with you. Um, so let's see. Let me scroll back down here. And then, um, and I'll have to look up the information, by the way, about the WIPC and the, and the um, DOS, and then get back with you on what may be the differences. I'll have to do, I'll have to do a little bit of a research and kind of look. Um, so Erica was saying, thank you for this group. Thank you so much for what you do. Well, you're quite welcome. Um, I'm hoping you benefit, right, from the advice and the information that you get here, because that is the purpose of the group and why I spend so much of the time that I do doing the things that I do. Um, so Courtney was saying private compensatory services for reading and math at home too. Okay. So uh, yeah, if this is private services, then I would just continue to ask for private services. That's what I would do. Um, so Courtney also said, do I have to be specific on the training? I'm not sure if you can. You, I mean, you just want to say, this program over here has proven to be effective for my child. I'm requesting that your teachers get training and this program that you've retained and used on my children. I just want my, you know, the teacher to get that training so it can continue to be used effectively for my child and my child can continue to make the progress that we're seeing. So that's kind of where you're wanting to go with that. Um, Yes, that's what I mean, Courtney, in that private compensatory services. So you want the public school teacher to receive training in whatever it is, whatever program it is that they're doing, so that when he's no longer working with them, right, that the public school teacher is trained in that same program and so can just continue working on with them. Um, so which browser and bookmark program do you use? Well, that's interesting, Jillian. I don't think anybody's ever asked. So I happen to use Chrome. Um, I don't know why. I just, it's the last one I just wound up using. Um, anyways, what I do is I use Chrome and I, um, there's a bookmark bar at the top. I have in there a folder called IEP. And in that IEP folder, I have probably 
50 or more subfolders in there, um, you know, like so larger tiered and then off of that and off of that, whatever it is that I needed to do to sort and organize information. And I think I found that's just the way I like, I do everything, every, all information as it comes in, mentally my brain kind of categorizes it sorts it and then kind of stuffs it into a filing cabinet for later retrieval. And so my bookmark system is quite similar that, you know, I see it as kind of this extension of how I think. And so I just, you know, where like whatever folder I think, you know, when I first read that article, it belongs in, that's where I drop it. So this way, if the information comes up again, kind of whatever my first thought is, that's probably where I should go look for it. And then I start looking there and then kind of, you know, well, okay, it wasn't that one. So what's the second thing that kind of pops into my mind? Oh, it's this. And then I'll go look in that folder for it. Um, but that's kind of, I just sit there and bookmark everything into various folders and subfolders until I have it all squared away. Um, and again, you have to remember too, I've kind of refined my system over, I would say the last five or six years. So for quite a while, um, but I think it's really handy. And one of the other things I like too about Chrome in particular is that Chrome has extensions for their browser, which includes um, Chrome Vault, which will keep track of all your passwords. And I really like that a lot because it keeps me from having to remember all of them. And it allows me to use complex passwords for things um, because I don't need to remember it. I just need to sign into my Google browser and then it automatically fills it in for me. So, um, oh, and another thing, and this is just something to think about, because, right, we're already here. We're already all on Facebook. So here's another little secret for you to store information for yourself is that, you know, like one of the things I do in this group is I hashtag, and I try to hashtag terms and things in this group so that you guys can find it easier, and sometimes for me to be able to find it easier in the group and pull it back up later. So um, one of the things that you can do is use that same concept, but you make a private group for yourself. And it's just yourself and you have to add one person into it to turn it into a group. So, you know, if you have some significant other or a family member, you just add them and then you're off and you're running. And then you have this secret group that only you and this other person can see. And in that group, you can start dropping information in and using the same hashtag system. So um, I'm not sure if it's a better way of doing things, but it's just another way potentially to kind of sort and organize information and have it for yourself sort of in the cloud, not stored on your home computer in case something happens to it. So just something to think about and consider. Um, anyways, Let's see here. Oh, and another thing for, because um, Jillian says, I lose my research all the time. I highly recommend some kind of cloud service. Like I use Dropbox. I'm a big fan of Dropbox. I've tried a few different cloud services. I like them best, even though they're more expensive than some of them, um, mostly because of their ease of use. They take any file, They'll hold it for me. I can easily share it because I can share a link to that folder or that file. That's what you often see me do in the group because um, I do the, I organize my Dropbox the same way I organize my bookmarks and the same way I feel like I think. Um, so in folders and again, in my Dropbox, I have an IEP folder and in it, I have all of my subfolders and then maybe subfolders after that. But those are the folders I share with you in the group. So I know I often share my folder, Girls with Autism. And um, I, you know, I do the peer reviewed or medical journal article research and I load up that folder. And then when I come across a situation I think it may apply, I leave you guys that link for you to access. Um, so if I do leave you one of my Dropbox folders and it's an active link, you're welcome to go in there, look through everything. If you even think something may be of interest to you at some point into the future, go ahead and download it um, because my links don't stay active forever. And part of that is because I can't have too many tapping into my personal Dropbox or they'll think I'm a business. 
and charge me a lot more money. So, um, I, you know, the links are temporary and they allow you temporary access. And when that happens, just go ahead and download, like I said, literally anything that seems that you might think of interest and store it on your computer or in your own cloud um, for your use. Because you can always delete it later. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Fotonia said, thank you so much for going live. You're quite welcome. I hope these are working much better that you're like can hear me and the video is much better um because it took a bit for us to get here but i'm really glad that you guys like it's working and it seems smooth now and it's beneficial um so jillian said so do you bookmark articles versus full website so i don't bookmark any full website what i do is i bookmark specific things off of websites so like one of the group rules is don't ever post, please, um, large group websites like understood.com. They've got some great stuff. I like a lot of their stuff. I really hate their pop-ups. They drive me nutty. Um, but the information they have on their site is awesome. Just as Rights Law, love Rights Law. They have a lot of great information. If you haven't been to rightslaw.com, I highly urge you to go there. But that site is so massive and it has so much information on it that unless you happen to know what it is that you're looking for, you're, there's you know specific keywords you know that you're looking for, these things can be impossible for somebody who is new to navigate. So um, if something comes up, then I try to share with you a specific link to that site answering whatever the situation is or giving you information for your situation. So um, that's what I try to do. And in this, this group, one of the biggest things that's most important to me, there's, well, there's a couple of them actually. So one is one of the groups that I was thrown out of early on and it forced me to make a decision and start my own group. So don't get me wrong, very thankful that that happened because I don't think I would have started my own group had I not. But um, I don't want a lot of people kind of competing with my advice, which is why I don't have advocates in here. I really don't have special education teachers. Um, I don't tend to have many professionals of any sort in here. Um, and part of that is I don't want them arguing with me and giving conflicting information. The idea for this group are for parents who are lost in the special education process. I want to find the people who are new to special education or who are lost in the process in order to try to help give them information and resources and help guide them so then they're not so lost and you feel like you've kind of got a grip and an understanding of what it is that you need to do. So that's one thing and, and why I have the three questions that I have is to try to weed people out because I don't want a bunch of people conflicting and giving conflicting information. So um, I forgot what the second point is, but I'm sure it'll come to me in a minute. Um, oh, well, the place for free advice. So this group is intended for parents. It's run by a parent. I will tell you, no, I don't have my law degree. No, I don't, I'm, you know, I don't have a degree in any kind of therapy. What I have a degree in is in my children. And because of my children, I've happened to have learned a whole lot of information. And I really have learned a lot of medical information. And then I've learned kind of how it, you know, ties to everything academically. And then that's when I realized, hey, I've got some really good information to share to people and information people want. And then, like I said, I happen to be really good at researching. So when I don't know something, then I can research it and I can give you the information. But I do want to tell you, whether it's me, um, whether it's somebody you think that's an authority and they have credentials, it doesn't matter. Always research information yourself. I try really hard. And I, and I don't want you to, to just rely on me for information. I try to take the time, that extra 
two seconds, 30 seconds to share with you whatever the link is for the resource where I pulled information, whether that's my blog post and my blog posts come embedded with a whole bunch of, you know, blue hyperlinks, please click on them. I put that in there and I take the time to do that to give you the information so you can see what I saw. And then, you know, you may read something and go, well, I didn't get that out of that, you know, and if so, let me know. And then I'd like to have a discussion with you because it's the way I understood this to mean when I wrote it. So, um, you know, always do your own research. And if you don't know, then, you know, just ask. I will do what I can to help you, you know, like learn to research, um, help you with giving you keywords, um, help you with, you know, just sort of general search and links. Um, and, you know, I'll help you with getting specific journal articles. So if you ever find a journal article, um, whether peer reviewed or a medical journal article, and you're wanting that information, if you give me the information and post it in the group, I can look and see if I have access to the entire article. If I do, I will download it for you and then upload it into the group. So these are things that, you know, I'll do for you. And when I write my post, I do link to um, essentially the abstract of whatever the journal article is that you can access online, but it may not be the whole article. And so if you are ever interested in reading the entire article of something that I've used as a reference in one of my blog posts, again, let me know because more likely than not, I have the entire article already in one of my Dropbox folders. So, you know, just let me know. Um, so, Feltonia <clears throat> was saying smart idea. Well, thank you. I was gonna say that's just self-preservation. I tried to remember everything, but I probably have forgotten more stuff than most people remember, um, just because I, I like learning new things. I can't stop. Um, so Jillian was saying, thank you. These are great ideas. And let me know if you need any more, you know, I'll try my best to help you out. Um, all right. So is it to Kita or, hmm. All right. Sorry if I murdered your name. Um, but you are quite welcome. Um, Fatonia said, nice. I just received my bachelor's degree. Um, and my children now going for my master's. That's very sweet. Yeah, I would say I have a PhD in my children, right? Um, and I do have bachelor's. I have two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree. So I am definitely a well-educated person by today's standards, right? But I was just going to say I don't technically have any kind of credentials per se to be an advocate besides being PhD in my children. So wanted to share that. So in all fairness, right, anything I tell you in the group, y'all understand, this comes from a place of a parent, you know, not from a teacher, not from an administrator, not from a medical professional. Um, it comes from the place of a parent who has dedicated a lot of their time to their children. So, um, and I'm glad that y'all can benefit from that information. All right, so does anybody else have any more questions tonight? Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, so Julie was asking, what are my degrees in? So very interesting. So I have a, um, well, so it took me 10 years to finish my bachelor's degrees. And that's why I wound up with degrees, plural, um, because I had a ton of community college credits. Um, so when I finished, I got a bachelor's of science in geology. I have a bachelor's of arts in earth science. I have a minor in biology. Um, and then I have a master's of science degree in environmental policy and management with an emphasis in environmental planning. So, and that's what I used to do professionally last is that I was a NEPA planner for the Arizona, um, department of transportation. And so that's what I did is I studied and focused and interpreted environmental law under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And so all I did is just sort of stopped that 
and just turned my focus to reading and interpreting special education law. And so I am not a lawyer. I am not a paralegal, but I do consider myself to be a legal scholar. And I can read and understand with the best of doctors and with the best of lawyers. And though the jargon sometimes will throw me off, I know how to use Google and research and then find out what does that jargon mean. Um, and that was why I was really glad and I appreciate all the comments and all the information that you guys gave me on the post when I asked you what is some special education jargon that really kind of throws you off. That's the reason I wrote those um, posts about special education terms to know. I wrote those because those were all terms that you guys told me that you didn't understand when you first started off in special education. And so I hope if you're new to the group that you do take time and read all three of those posts. It took me quite a while to get all of those done because they're not just, you know, a straight like LRE means least restrictive environment. No, I expand upon that and I tell you and get, you know, show you where guidance is and et cetera concerning the least restrictive environment. And I tried to embed a whole bunch of links to resources throughout all of those posts so that you can read and look at that information. Um, so I really hope you find those useful. So Feltonia, she goes, I get so overwhelmed with paperwork. Yes. Are you talking about filling it out or filing it like it accumulates? So if you look right here, this was a brand new bookshelf that was put here just a couple of weeks ago. And you can see there's already like a hefty amount of stuff over there. And then I have all of this sitting on top of my printer. So you're not the only one. I have a problem with paperwork too. Um, not only uh, with having um, the three surviving quadruplets. So when I fill out paperwork, I have to fill it out in triplicate. Um, but also I get paperwork back in triplicate. So for the DVD, they recently sent me my children's family service plans. So basically kind of like an IEP and I had three of them. And so I had to take those three of them and I run them through my printer and I make a digital copy. And then after that, I take that information and I upload it into my Dropbox that's under my child's name. And I have like my child's name and then I have, you know, medical information, educational information. And then under each one of those, I have additional folders broken out into, you know, like if it's medical, which doctors or um, like um, diagnoses that I might get. And then if it's educational, you know, I have like their neuropsych testing and all that other stuff. It's all in my educational folder. Anyways, I do the best I can. I have so much paperwork and it takes forever. So if you can stay on top of it, that's good. Um, I try to sit down probably once or twice a year and take care of all the stacks of paperwork that are hanging around. Um, but it's good to get to more often than that if you can, because the worst thing that could, you know, happen, uh, well, no, it's not the worst thing. So a bad thing that could happen to you is your house catching on fire and then all of your records are gone. And then you would have to try to get these records from all of the previous schools, which may or may not have them, or maybe they've been stored now. So instead of going through that headache, I think it's worth, you know, worth it to take the time to try to stay on top of it. I would say, I would shoot for every quarter, every three months, just sort of pick a date and go, I'm going to commit and I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to scan this stuff and file it and put it away. And so I'm done with it. And I think if you did that, you would be a lot happier and then you would feel a lot less overwhelmed. Um, and then all the stuff would be stored digitally. So it's, you know, safe. And then um, it's easy to share. So if something comes up and you do need to share it, then you've got an easy way to share it. So Becky was saying, is this group specifically for Arizona? I'm relatively new here. No, Becky, I've had this group for almost three years, three and two and a half years. So um, no, this group is actually for everyone across the United States. I just happened to be in Arizona and I did start my nonprofit there. My nonprofit is the group, you know, that's, you know, sponsors, showed as a sponsor to this group. And so it's Arizona Exceptional Students Association. I formed that nonprofit 
in order to bring more of my advocacy work that I've been doing through Facebook and across the United States, um, basically more to my home state and where I am here in Arizona. So, um, but no, this group is literally um, a national group. I have helped people in Puerto Rico, in Hawaii, in California, um, in Alaska, um, Montana, Kansas, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Wyoming, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, New York, Florida, lots of people from Texas, but it's a big state. Um, so really it is um, truly a national group. And I, because I can look things up, um, I, you know, I don't have too hard of a time um, being able to give good guidance. Um, and then I would almost verge on saying excellent guidance for pretty much every state. There are little state nuances. Sometimes I may not know that somebody from that state may know, um, but that's why I like this group. The idea for the group is to share and for us to learn from each other, right? I don't profess to know everything. I'm not Mary Poppins, um, but I try my darndest to be as knowledgeable as I can. Um, just like tonight, Gina brought up, there is a pragmatic screener for the clef. I didn't know that. Um, so I'm very thankful that she knew that information and could tell me. But um, yeah, I tend to know um, most of the information and then can usually, like I said, give very good guidance um, for everybody in every state. So let's see. Um, let's see. So Feltonia was saying good ideas. Um, and then my husband, John. So John, John Harris, he's my husband, by the way. Um, and he's one of the admins in the group. So if you see him around, uh, that's who he is and his relation to me. Uh, let's see. So Phil Tony said this weekend I'll be scanning. That'll be great. I know it'll be a pain. And, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's terrible to do. Like you hate taking the time to do it because you want to do other things or you're tired or whatever. Um, and it's, as an adult, one of those things, right? It's like task avoidance. I don't want to do it. Um, but the adult in you has to say, I got to suck it up and I got to go do it anyways. Because that's the part about being an adult, right? You got to suck it up and go do things you hate doing anyways. Uh, let's see. So uh, Becky was saying, awesome. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Um, I, since you are relatively new, hopefully you will understand um, what's going on in the group. If you don't, please ask. Also, um, you know, hopefully you will find the group helpful and find there's a lot of really relevant and good information in the group. Um, also, if you have any questions, please ask. I know I've had a couple of people lately see, keep saying sorry to me for asking questions. That's what this group is for. This group is for you to learn. You can't learn if you don't ask. This is often even what I have to tell my own children. I have to remind them, right? If you don't tell me, I, how can I know? Like, I don't know that you don't know. So the best way is to let me know you have a problem and that here's what my problem is. And that way I'll do the best I can to address your problem. That's part of the reason I built this group. I wanted this group to give parents no matter where you lived you know when you write like here's my issue that i'm having with the school i wanted to be able to give you the very best information that i can with your state's resources and the most relevant information to you so you don't need to go and hopefully find much of anything you have all the information you need right there. It's stressful enough to be the parent to a special needs child, but it's infinitely more stressful to be the parents of a special needs child and then feeling overwhelmed by all the things that your child is requiring. And often you don't know the right terms um, to look up. You don't know the right words to say, so you can speak the same jargon the school is speaking. You don't know these things. So 
you don't know them until somebody tells you until somebody teaches you or gives you at least like you know here's a hint go look down this way that's what I want to do. I'm going to be able to help you and save you some of that time and struggle because why not? You know, I have this information. I can do that. It takes me, I have had a few people literally say to me, they have spent a week or two looking for information that literally took me no more than three minutes to find for them because I knew where to look. I knew what keywords to search for. It was information I'd looked up before. So it was nothing for me to look it up. You know, I don't want you to sit and struggle for weeks on end for no particularly good reason. So if you need information, please say something. There's a high likelihood that if I haven't already found it before, I'll know quickly what it is I need to search for in order to get that information to you fast. So, um, Yes, Phil Tony said, yes, it's time consuming. Yeah, absolutely. I will tell you to help ease the burden. I shrink a screen down really tiny on the side of my computer. And I try to watch some kind of show I enjoy watching in this tiny square on my computer. But at least it's something to kind of watch and look at while I'm sitting here doing all this kind of boring paperwork. So I reward myself as I'm doing the work by watching a show that I enjoy watching. Um, let's see. So John says, question from the group, can bus accommodations be added to an existing 504? Hmm. Normally when you hear about busing accommodations, that's under an IEP. And I have to say, I'm not entirely sure. Now I would think so. Um, but the, and the best resource to check is the um, parent educator guide to section 504 that was put out by the office of civil rights and i can tell you now that's exactly what i would be going and looking in so what i do and just here's like another research trick for you because a lot of people don't know this trick um, now you do need to know keywords right keywords or words of relevance to whatever it is that you're looking for so in this case we have two we have bus and we have transportation so what I would do is I would open up this PDF document and then I would hit control and F on my keyboard. Now I'm a Mac user or sorry, I'm an IBM user for a Mac user. I think it's alt and no, it's the Mac sign. It's whatever the version of control is for um, an iPad and um, or a Mac. And then you want to hit F. And so what that does, that opens up the find function in the document. And then you type in the word bus and then you hit enter and it will take you to every point in which bus is mentioned in that document because the document is I'm thinking it's 137 pages um, and, and it's great. And if you please take the time to read it from front to back, if your child has a 504, it is well worth the read and you probably will need to read it two or three times to truly take in all the information that's in this. Um, but anyways, it's just a fast way to quickly search for specific information. And so besides bus, the other one I would look for, like I said, is, you know, I would erase that one and then put in transportation and then hit search and then see where it's mentioned in the document. And so that's what I would do to look and find it. Um, and it's worth taking the time to do those things. So um, John kind of went on to elaborate saying that he's having some behavior issues because he's being bullied. I will tell you um, for the bullying, file a bullying report. Now, that doesn't mean you verbally complain. We never verbally tell the school anything that does zero every time. What we're going to do instead is we're going to write a letter and we're going to send it to the principal. But really the best thing is to just call up your school district and ask them how you can anonymously file a bullying report for your child. And then they should have some way for you to do that. And then that's what I would do. And then that kicks off a formal investigation. Can't kind of be swept under the rug. So I would do that. And if you need to know what it is that are the, you know, laws of, for bullying in your state, 
let me know. Again, I often look up that information and share that information to the group. And it, and it does vary by state because it depends on what your state laws, like what laws have been passed. So, um, you know, if you need more information on bullying and how to address that, please let me know in the group with a post and I can address these as they come up and give you the information. So that's the other thing. Please make sure you put the state that you're in since we are a national group. Okay. So we are at about the hour and a half mark. Um, we seem to run about an hour and a half and it does seem to work pretty good, oddly. But I think that's because we're running from East Coast to West Coast. So I have some people on the East Coast who fall off and then people from the West Coast who come on a little later. Um, so this is kind of allowing us to pick up both ends. So this continues to work for everyone, you know, just let me know. And then we'll continue to run these at about the same time so that we can kind of hit from East to West Coast. Um, along with those who are up in Canada and elsewhere, because we do have some people from England and Ireland um, who are part of the group too. So um, Patricia said, hi, my question is, how do you go about requesting staff have training on different levels of autism and um, the difference between a meltdown and a temper tantrum so that they are able to help the children deescalate? So you can ask for the teachers to receive additional training in how to deal with children with behavior issues. You can ask somebody in the community to come in and to give a training to the teachers. You know, so some kind of group or organization that's local to you that deals with autism to come in and to give a training about autism. Um, and, and then of course, you know, they'll address the whole issue with a meltdown versus a temper tantrum. Um, also, another idea is that link I posted earlier, which is um, to, um, you know, like request the teacher parent training and it's from Rights Law. I really like that one and explains it well, how you can go about getting information and um, requesting that teachers be trained. And don't forget, we're so close to the end of the school year now. You want to make sure that you hit the teachers your child will have next year so you can get them training before your child even arrives. That would be ideal. Um, so if you need more information, Patricia, on that, let me know. And then what I'll do is um, just post in the group and then I'll answer from there. Uh, so Fultonia says, I'm still having trouble understanding the difference between a 504 plan and IEPs. Did you have a chance to reach through the post about um, special education terms to know? If you read through there, I, I describe what a 504 is and what an IEP is and then I describe a bit about the differences between the two. So the main difference is 504s don't tend to contain goals. That's not what they're made for because you don't, there's no requirement to revisit them every year like there is under IDEA. Also, um, you under a 504, that does not contain anything concerning modified curriculum for your child that can only be done under a, an IEP. So those are two main differences right there. Um, and I think to me, that's the bigger break between one or the other. If your child is doing fairly well and they only need accommodation, then a 504 is fine. So, um, and then she said, my son has epilepsy and they want him to have a 504 instead of an IEP. Potentially that could be fine. Why does it do you feel like he needs an IEP versus a 504? Um, oh, and she said he already has an IEP for autism. Okay, so if he already has an IEP for autism, then the epilepsy should just be added. And it's not that you put it in a 504. What you do is, is you do an individualized medical plan or individualized health plan, depends on what they call it. Usually you see individualized health plan, but it's something your school nurse sets up and what it is, is it discusses what happens in case your child has a seizure. Like what are they supposed to do? Um, so that's what I would think, I don't know. I would, 
you, you don't ever have a 504 and an IEP at the same time. So I don't know if they're trying to tell you that, you know, his autism is well enough, educationally speaking, that he doesn't need an autism IEP anymore, or if you mean they're wanting to add a 504 for the epilepsy. But again, it makes no sense because 504, when it, um, the IEP, sorry, when it's done correctly, encompasses everything under 504 also. So there's not really ever a need to have an IEP and a 504 at the same time, except for there are a few instances. So one of them that I do know of is if the child has a temporary additional disability, say like they broke their leg, then you might, you know, they have their IEP, but you might add a medical 504 on top of that as something temporary um, and, you know, kind of work it that way. So um, it's just one way to address it. And then let's see. Um, Patricia said, awesome, thank you, you're welcome. Like I said, and also, no, don't forget, anytime you have questions, just post them in the group. I try my best to make sure I go through and I do answer all of your posts. Um, let's see, so Nat says, my main takeaway is the state can help you much more with an IEP and the state is way easier than OCR. No, I was gonna say, I don't know if that's quite true, um, but you know, they do each have their plus and minuses and because uh, like a 504, you can get done quickly compared to an IEP. And um, it's easier to do. Usually schools give you less grief. They're more likely to give you a 504 without much questioning where, you know, you can get a major interrogation if you want an IEP. And if your child makes good grades, good golly, how could they possibly need an IEP even though that's not what FAPE says, which is so weird, um, and something you should definitely fight if they ever tell you. But, um, you know, so that's what, there's plus and minuses to both. It just really depends what it is that your child needs. So Feltonia said he regressed after a seizure. That's very common. Unfortunately, um, basically, a seizure is nothing more than like a neural storm in the brain. And it sort of fries the brain's circuits that help working memory. Often you will see children who have issues with epilepsy have working memory problems, and it's not uncommon for also their processing speed to become impaired. So those are things to watch too, and keep an eye on the scores in working memory and processing speed, because if he needs accommodations in those areas, it, they're easy to do, and I have, again, blog posts that address each one of those areas, one on working memory and one on processing speed. And each one of those posts are chock full of accommodations and uh, so a few modifications of things that you could ask for for your child. So Patricia says, I don't understand, but here in New Jersey, my one son has a, um, a speech-only IEP and a 504 for everything else. His 504 is loaded. Yeah, that's completely backwards. It makes no sense. Now, in the bigger scheme of things, right, this goes back to case law and case law precedents. And case law says, we don't really care what you got going on over there. Is the child getting FAPE? Is he getting a free, appropriate public education? That's what they care about. So um, it's a really backwards way of doing it and a really poor and odd way of doing it. Um, but on the other hand, is it working? Is it, if it's working, you know, you might just want to continue just using it and just going with the flow. So um, just something to think about, Patricia, because, you know, again, what really matters is, is he getting that free and appropriate public education? So, um, and you would be able to best answer that. All right. So um, we're a little over an hour and a half and people who watch this later, let's try not to kill them here with long sessions. So we're gonna wrap this up. Also, it'll give me a chance. I was supposed to eat my dinner and I didn't and I need to heat it back up. <laughs> um, but anyways, I hope you guys have a good evening. 
Um, again, if you have any questions, please post your questions in the group. Don't worry about if you're asking a lot of questions or your question might be dumb or whatever. It, it makes no difference. We're all here to learn from every question that's posted. Usually there's something to learn. Even myself, um, as long as I've done this, because I've done this now for, oh, uh, either five or six years, that I'm, you know, still learning stuff all the time. And um, I, I just, you know, I think it's a great educational environment to be in this group and to be with other parents and to be able to um, empower one another. So um, let's see here. So Tiffany had a quick question. So let me answer this real quick. And then we're going to go for this evening. But like I said, the rest of you do ask your questions in the group. So Tiffany said, hi, my daughter's current IEP. They put her under other health impairment, OHI, but her doctor said she clearly has a learning disorder. Her diagnosis of autism, ADHD, and then she has a chromosome deletion along with anxiety as well as a communication disorder. Um, she said, how do I get them to put her on special ed and not in general ed? I want, I don't want her to fall off the charts before they put her in special ed. So the best way to do that is that you need to write a request and tell them that you want a full psychoeducational evaluation under IDEA. And I have a template letter and um, it's been shared in the group just recently. Um, it's also in the announcement post at the, you know, near the top. Um, you got to like, there's the first little set of posts for people who are new, brand new to special education. And then you see the group rules. And then right after that are more posts. And then it's just, you know, what like second or third one down after that, um, is my template letter. And I probably will swing back through here, um, tonight or tomorrow. And I'll drop the link if my husband doesn't get around to it before I do. Um, but I would, you know, kind of go off a bit of that template letter and then, you know, just write your letter and tell them you want full testing. And, you know, I can kind of help you with some of this because with autism and ADHD, just alone, there's, um, a matter of fact, what I would suggest you do, let's go look at my autism unit. I think that would be really helpful. I know people are having a hard time finding the units and I can pull tomorrow from there and put the links into the group. But the autism unit, I think, will be really helpful for you if you read through that information there. And it'll help you decide what areas you need to ask to test for. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for hanging in with me and, you know, kind of sharing this evening with me. I hope you all learned something and I hope you found this educational. And we will do this again next week, right about at the same time. So see you guys next Wednesday. Have a good night.